All life on Earth is made of cells containing DNA, the blueprint for an organism. This chain of nucleotides is encoded with the information and instructions for building an organism. It is a symbolically encoded, abstractly represented message conveying expected actions and expected purposes, also known as universal information. Evolutionists just think this all came together by random chance. They seem to forget that this would violate the scientific laws of information. All of this necessarily implies that the information in DNA requires an intelligent designer. So why haven't all these supposed scientists admitted that evolution fails and the proof of creation is encoded in each of us? I had to investigate. It is an unfortunate truth that the single greatest motivator for innovation in human ventures is war. For example, the work NASA does is funded because of its applications toward building better weaponry. Even private companies like Bell Labs have been contracted by the government to develop communication technology for wartime applications and the future rights to that technology. During World War II, the Allied and Axis forces were exhausting copious amounts of money toward encryption and decryption for military communication within and between between theaters of war. In 1941, Claude Shannon was recruited to join the team at Bell Labs in fulfilling their cryptography contract for the military. Shannon had gotten his degree from MIT. His game-changing master's thesis, A Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits, revolutionized computers. By utilizing the binary digital concept of 19th century mathematician George Boole, Shannon and others devised a method for computing based on binary digits or bits. This method became very figurative in the work of Alan Turing and in developing digital computers and was described by Howard Gardner as possibly the most important and also the most noted master's thesis of the century. We will cover more on this in next week's episode. While working in cryptography for Bell Labs and innovating new methods of cryptography, Shannon took a different approach than his contemporaries. As cryptography became more advanced, it became more and more difficult to separate enemy signals from signal noise. For reasons I will address shortly, Shannon's approach considered the signal as part of the noise. Pulling from Norbert Wiener's early work on probability theory, in 1948, Shannon published A Mathematical Theory of Cryptography, which was eventually declassified and published as Communication Theory of Secrecy Systems the following year. For this model, Shannon defined information as a resolution of uncertainty or entropy in a system. Far from being merely chaos, entropy is measured by the uncertainty of the precise location, velocity, or physical nature of particles in a system. Much like in quantum mechanics, where the location, velocity, or physical nature of a particle cannot be resolved un until it is observed, collapsing to what is called a wave function, the information of a system also cannot be determined until this same collapse occurs in a variable. In fact, the collapse of a wave function to either a particle or wave is the resolution of entropy that gives us the information on whether or not light is traveling as a particle or a wave in the famous double slit experiment. Since we know there are two possible states for the photon of light to exist in, we can also state that before the observation it has two probabilities, but only 50 50% certainty. After the observation, we can see that it's traveling as a wave or we can see that it is traveling as a particle. The number of potential states is now 1, the certainty is now 100%, and the entropy is 0. This is one digit of information. So in this sense, information might be defined as certainty, the opposite of entropy. We can also quantify the value of the information in a digit by the amount of entropy it resolves. Continuing Shannon's application of Boolean binary calculation, entropy is calculated by determining the minimum number of yes or no questions a bit answers. A common metaphor for this is the result of a coin flip. There are two sides to the coin, so before the flip, there is only one question you need to ask to determine the result of the flip, heads or tails. Because the result is determined by one question, it has an entropy of one. For a larger example, if someone arranged a founding member of the rock band KISS to attend your birthday party but didn't tell you which one, before the party, the question of who will attend has four potential answers, as there are four founding members of the band KISS. Determining which member can be resolved with two questions. Question one. Are they a current member? In this case, the answer is no, so we know we can eliminate Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley. Question two, is it Ace Fraley? Whatever the answer is, we now know who the guest is after asking only two yes or no questions, so the entropy is two. 
Once Peter Chris walks through the door at the party, that entropy has now collapsed to zero and the certainty to 100% as we now know which one of the four members is attending. Again, we have one digit of information resolving an entropy of two and a fairly disappointed crowd because who really wants Peter Chris at their party? For a natural example, when you visit Red Rock Canyon in Nevada, you'll notice the red walls of the canyon, which are its namesake. A geologist, however, might see this same red coloring and deduce that the red color in the walls is the result of rust. If the red color is the result of rust, then the material in the walls will be composed of oxidized iron, so we can propose a test. Before analyzing, we have two options. Either the wall is composed of oxidized iron or it isn't, so our entropy is 1. In the case of Red Rock, yes, it is composed of oxidized iron, so we now have one digit of information resolving an entropy of 1. This is true whether or not an intelligence is responsible. A true understanding of information theory requires some familiarity with calculus, but for simplicity, in this episode I will not be addressing the resolution of the individual properties for each answer to a variable, nor how entropy is calculated for chains of digits, nor how we use logarithms in calculating entropy. I will be concentrating solely on the digital applications of this definition for information, but it should be noted that these same principles apply to analog information as well. Shannon's model describes the most minimal communication system as a source, the origin of the message, a transmitter, the means of transmission, a channel, the medium in which the transmission is traveling, a receiver, the means of receiving the transmission, and a destination, the recipient of the transmission. For communication to successfully occur, the information at the source and the information at the destination should match to a high degree. All communication is subject to potential distortion. This is why Shannon chose to consider the message being sent as part of the signal noise instead of being distinct from it. He began working on methods of detecting signals via non-random repeaters within signal noise. He found that redundancy is the rule, not the exception in communication. Repetition of information is a necessity when the line of communication is impeded in any way. Even in your everyday speech, when we phrase a sentence in English like, she lived in her own tract home, we are employing redundancies. She and her both convey the subject's gender. Lived in and home both convey residence. Her conveys ownership, so own is completely redundant, and so on. This doesn't even factor in inflections of the voice or body language. These subtle redundancies make it easier to piece together the intended message via context when the received message is distorted or degraded. Even in a loud room or over a choppy streaming feed, you can probably make out what I'm trying to convey. We also see redundancies in the genome due to simple duplication mutations all the time. Whether intended or not, these redundancies do act as part of the self-correcting message mechanism as well as conduits for the development of novel features resulting from subsequent mutations. Leaving aside the calculations for the relationships between redundancy and probability of correctly deciphering the message, Shannon's models were immensely useful in detecting and deciphering enemy signals. They were also helpful in his development of the one-time pad, an encryption technique that cannot be cracked and was tested by openly publishing a message encrypted by it. Shannon's concepts were published as a mathematical theory of information in the October 1940 issue of Bell System Technical Journal. Over the next year, Shannon worked with Warren Weaver to develop his theory. He had merely envisioned it as a means of dealing with information over media such as radio, but had soon found that his theories apply to all forms of communication. In 1949, the two published their book, The Mathematical Theory of Communication, including his initial 1948 paper retitled to reflect the universality of his theory's applications. This work also assisted Bell Labs in developing the regenerative repeater, which acts as a re Relay in digital communications by reconstructing the signal over the course of its journey via redundancies, renewing the signal over and over. This has made it possible for you to have high-speed internet, HDTV, CDs, and even archiving systems like RAR and ZIP. Shannon's work is also useful in genetics when considering the transfer of genes and reproduction. All of this is due to information theory, but nowhere in Shannon's work is the actual content of the information considered. A retired German engineer, Werner Gitt, decided to tackle that issue. Gitt, a young Earth creationist, had been the head of the Department of Information Technology at the German Federal Institute of Physics and Technology. In 1997, he published In the Beginning Was Information and posited a specific definition for information to distinguish message content from Shannon's concepts. He introduced the term universal universal information and described it as a symbolically encoded, abstractly represented message conveying the expected actions and intended purposes. In this context, message
message is meant to include instructions for carrying out a specific task or eliciting a specific response. And with that definition, he introduced his scientific laws of information and proceeded to use them to come to the conclusion that DNA is a code that was encoded by an intelligent agency. Now, to date, there have been no real-world applications or revolutions in technology derived from these laws, but we can test them for their application. The first law, information is a non-material entity. It's less of a law than a decree, and since Shannon's concepts are all based on quantifiable measurements, its veracity is debatable depending on what you mean by material. The second law, a material entity cannot create a non-material entity, is demonstrably wrong whether or not the first law is true. As we saw in Red Rock Canyon, oxygen and iron created the color red, which gave us the information we needed to determine the composition of the rocks. Under any definition, and regardless of whether the first law is true, that is information being produced by a material entity. The third and fourth laws Universal information cannot be created by purely random processes and universal information can only be created by an intelligent sender are the first ones to actually address his concept of universal information. They too are demonstrably wrong. If you know anything about hiking, you will be familiar with trail signs. This particular trail sign means go this way. So does this one. So does this one. It should not, however, surprise you to know that each of these trail signs are designed specifically to reduce their impact on the ecosystem by resembling an arrangement that appears randomly. These do, in fact, convey instructions and do, in fact, appear by random chance, and yet they are indistinguishable from the identical message sent by a conscious entity. The fifth law, the pragmatic attribute of universal information requires a machine, holds true, but is redundant, and not in a good Shannon leading to HD TV and high-speed internet kind of way. Science by definition is mechanistic. We don't need a whole new law for information establishing that. In episode 53, I covered a few methods of new information arising in the genome through random mutation, including the emergence of new morphologies, new metabolic pathways, and new resistances to microbial threats. All of these establish that the sixth law, existing universal information, is never increased over time by purely physical chemical processes, also fails. Applying these laws to DNA, the genes are chemicals that in cite particular chemical reactions. There is no instruction involved, so Git's definition of universal information does not apply. DNA is material. Genes are material. Nucleotides are material. The chemical reactions transferring the genes are material events fulfilling chemical processes. The first law doesn't apply whether or not information is material. The result of cellular mitosis is two material cells chemically constructed by chemical reactions to chemical stimuli. Every step is a physical process, so the second law does not apply to DNA. Each time a gene is transferred, it's due to chemical reactions. There is no intelligence that reads the information from the genes. There is no intelligence that understands the information and uses it to build an organism. And there is no intelligence that encodes the DNA into that new organism to start the cycle all over again. Whether or not there is an intelligence behind the information in DNA, there is no part of it that we can currently observe which requires it. Whether or not there is intelligence behind information, Shannon's definition allows us to identify information without any appeal to the supernatural. It has real applications that you are benefiting from right now as you watch this video on a digital stream in HD. Whether or not there is any intelligence behind the information in DNA, Git has yet to present a single real-world application for his supposed theories and scientific laws. Therefore, whether or not there is an intelligence behind the information in DNA, the assertion that there is, is scientifically useless, other than being another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.